um, or valuable towards your studying. The uh, other thing I was going to mention, I put up some useful information in that daily quiz area so that you can use that information. There's like a periodic table in there, uh, but then also a couple conversion factors. And it's noted within the file the, uh, the conversion factors that you would generally be provided with on exams. So when you're looking at that sample info, if you focus on that yellow highlighted information, use that information as you're solving problems because that's the type of information you'll be provided with on exams. Like one inch is 2.54 centimeters. That's usually something we provide on a test. We don't expect you to memorize these random conversion factors. Okay, so again, problem set one extended till tonight. Problem set two, a fast turnaround. I think mastering has been working well for the last uh, day. There were some issues Monday, but I think those were ironed out. So I think most of you guys have been able to do your homework. There are a few issues still going on. If you can't get your account set up today, again, make sure to, to visit the Pearson Support Rep's office hours. Try to seek them out. You can use Pearson Support if you're still stuck. Um, but let me know if you continue to have issues. But problem set two, quick turnaround for that one. These problem sets are not particularly long. They should only take you about a half hour to an hour to do. Um, and generally, I would still recommend closing your book and trying to force yourself to use the knowledge that you built to solve the problems. Um, because that's the environment you're going to be in at the exams. You know, so if you really want to get good at the exam type problems and solving problems on your own, you know, try to use that approach to the quizzes and the homework and I think you'll find that that works out well for you. Um, so the uh, uh, one thing I want to mention from last lecture, these volume conversions, I actually had it backwards. I had that, um, that uh, I forget what, what I had last time. What did I have in the notes? It was I had uh, one cubic meter was 0 .001 liters which if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense. So a meter by a meter by a meter is more like a thousand liters. So I have my conversion backwards um, at the very end of class. Uh, but anyway, so I just wanted to summarize to make sure that, that we sort of clarify that one meter by one meter by one meter is really a thousand liters. And then one liter is the tiny um, number of cubic meters. Uh, not the most used uh, conversion factor. The most used conversion factor in a class like this one is just the simple one-to-one -one relationship whoops, of uh, cubic centimeters to milliliters. So the more useful conversion that we tend to use is a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. So that kind of takes us from the length scale where the SI unit of length is the meter, then we can convert to centimeters, and then we can relate that to this um, sort of SI derived unit of volume of the liter or the milliliter. So a cubic centimeter is exactly a milliliter. So today we're gonna do some dimensional analysis problems, some conversion problems. Next lecture on Friday, we start chapter two. Um, I kind of changed gears a little bit. The intro video for chapter one, I thought was a little too light and needed to be a little bit longer. So the intro videos will be like a little bit longer than say 10 or 15 minutes, a little bit more in depth. They'll give you a really good overview of the chapter. And then the summary video will give you a little bit more information. So I'm gonna be aiming the intro and then the summary videos to be about equal in length. So aiming for about 30 to 45 minutes for these videos. Um, I think they'll give you a good amount of ability to start being able to solve and think about the problems we want you to solve within the chapters. So check those out. If you prefer to skim and read, those are fine options as well. So if you'd rather skim the book, do more thorough reading on your own, um, definitely recommend skimming through an entire chapter before we started in class so that you kind of have an idea of the vocabulary, the main topics we're getting into. You'll be really ready for uh, lecture if you approach it that way. Okay, so let's do another sig fig problem before we get started. And if I could have you guys do, like, rarely do I have kind of problems, you guys, where I really want you to do it by your style. Um, not really because it's busy, but just because I want to, give, want to give you guys a chance to solve a problem just by yourself. So give this problem a try. I'll put it up the top. If you want to um, give yourself a chance to you know, make sure we can solve this problem.
Okay, so let's take a look at the solution to this one. Uh, so mixed operation problems, sometimes they're trickier when things end in zero, sometimes they're not, I don't know. This problem, you may find it tricky because it works out numerically just to equal 120, right? So we throw this into our calculator. And the first inkling is not saying, well, 120 is two sig figs, because that's a different sort of problem. If I just said in a different context that, um, that I took a measurement and it's 120 meters, you would say, okay, that's two sig figs. Um, but that's a different context, and you do a calculation with numbers. Uh, we have to use those numbers to work out the sig figs, not what our calculator says. We're trying to see, do we need to add zeros onto this? We need to take zeros away? Um, do we need to round this? How do we need to approach the rounding and the reporting of this, this result? And so the first multiplication, you know, we do the 300 times 40. Um, and that's definitely has four sig figs. So four sig figs times four sig figs. And so that works out to be, um, what, 1,200? But all four of those zeros are significant. And so I can underline that to help me note that, okay, all four of those zeros are significant. Um, and so then the next step, I need to do 7.50 plus 2.50. These are seconds. The units here are just trying to imply that these are, are inexact quantities. So these are things we should be counting and tracking sig figs in. And so we add these two together. How many sig figs does the sum of 7.50 and 2.50 work out to? It should be four, because it goes to 10.00. Add and subtract, it's all about the placeholders. So we're adding and subtracting. It's like, I'm just looking at the, the last digits these values are given to and then reporting the result to that same placeholder. So it ends up being 10.00. So a lot of zeros in this problem, but yes? Uh, probably. <laughs> I shouldn't do math in my head. I'll believe you. I don't. So 12,000, yeah. Simple arithmetic in front of a class, yeah, that's always the, the worst. I don't even know why. I, I believe you. I'm, yeah, because like 300 times 4 would be 1,200. <laughs> okay, yes, you're right. Okay, so then I have 12,000 divided by 10. So that works out to be, so the answer you're seeing in your calculators is 1,200. Okay. And so 1,200 is in our calculators and we plug in all the math to solve the problem. And the question is how many of those digits are significant? Is it one, is it two, is it three, is it four, is it infinite? Infinite's a weird choice, so it's usually never going to be infinite. The only way infinite would be the answer is if these were like exact numbers. So if these were, were all taken to be exact quantities, like if we're adding up conversion factors or something, maybe then we might say something's infinite. It's probably better to say that when you're looking at like one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, it's probably better to say sig figs just don't apply to numbers that are exact than to think of them as having some number of sig figs. Um, but anyway, so 1,200, all four digits end up being significant. So we would have to report this number as 1.200 times 10 to the 3, and then meters per second, where all four digits are significant. OK, and we're getting that because we work out the first multiplication has four sig figs, the summation has four sig figs, then we carry out that final division step, four sig figs divided by four sig figs, applying the division rule, we count sig figs. So we report to four sig figs. Okay, so multiplication division, kind of easy when we just have one of those problems. We're just counting sig figs and rounding accordingly, um, or extending the result accordingly for adding zeros that are significant. And then adding, subtracting, relatively easy. We're looking at the placeholders. But then we do these mixed operations. We just have to do the multiplication, think of our sig fig rule, do the sum, think of our sig fig rule, do the final division, and apply that sig fig rule. So we just apply the sig fig rules that match the math operation that we're doing. Okay, so the result here, four sig figs. Okay, so from that, um, again, let's keep doing sig fig problems if we're stuck, like seek them out on quizzes. If you, be, if you get to the point where you're like automatic with sig figs and there's a quiz problem on sig figs, you can probably skip it. You know, it's like you can skip problems when you know how to do them so you can focus on the ones that maybe you find to be more tricky. Okay, so let's do one of these conversions I mentioned last time, how we're responsible for knowing the giga, mega, kilo, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico numbers. And probably the best way is just to make sure you remember the ones you know. Um, you know, so for like kilo, I think we all know what the, the kilo converts to. The mega is the next, then the giga. If you get yourself in the order, then you can remember millis to the minus three, micros to the minus six, then it's nano, then it's pico for minus nine and minus 12. So work this problem out here. So 
give this one a try. You can go back to trying the problem and then comparing answers with your neighbors on this one if you want. about one more minute on this one. Okay, so this one here, we haven't quite, I mean, it's funny that the very last section in chapter one is titled dimensional analysis, and we've used dimensional analysis a fair bit, and it's really not like you've never heard of dimensional analysis. So the way I like to approach most chapters is, you know, we're gonna use a lot of the chapter and various problems a lot of different times instead of just waiting till the very last section and doing one or two examples on something. So um, this might be the first time we've really like thoughtfully use dimensional analysis, or at least I'm gonna like talk about it in class, but um, I'm sure you've used this technique a bunch of times, but that's the one where we just try to figure out how many centimeters are in a meter. Obviously one, cent, um, one meter contains 100 centimeters, and it's usually just a matter of thinking is 100 centimeters is a meter, or is it 100 meters is one centimeter. So it's really just a matter of making sure we get the right unit on to the, to the 100 in the right place. And so then the same thing with the nano, so as we go to nano, Hopefully we remember micro is the minus six, then it's nano, so nano is the minus nine. And so we could approach this two ways. We could say, well, how many nanometers are in a meter? Um, that would be the big number. The nano is really small, so there's gonna be a lot of the really small things in a big meter. So that'd be 10 to the nine uh, nanometers. And so we've canceled our meters, canceled our centimeters, ended up with the unit we're looking for. So I like to start dimensional analysis. This ends up being a big problem solving technique that we use in a lot of problems that aren't really maybe classic unit conversion problems where we'll solve a lot of problems in chemistry where we start with what it is we're looking for, we start with something that we're given, and then we just kind of work our way through the information provided in the problem to help us solve it. So dimensional analysis becomes kind of a catch-all for a lot of, uh, for a general technique we use to solve a wide variety of problems in a class like this one. Okay, so easy enough problem to do. It's just really more about remembering and knowing that you have to know those uh, prefix conversion factors um, for like the nano, the pico, 
and the other ones that we mentioned earlier. So this ends up working out, working out to be answer A. So the um, question I have, did anybody get 2.5 million and they were kind of like stuck? Anybody want to admit that they got a wrong answer and they were kind of struggling to figure out? If you got 2.5 million, um, and this is just a, a general math reminder, if you haven't used these TI calculators in a while, one, it's good to use these so you get used to it. Did anybody happen to do 10 E9 for this step here? Because that's probably where you might have gotten 2.5 million from. So the 10 E9 would be 10 times 10 to the 9. Um, you know, so, so if you want to do 10 to the 9, there's two ways easily to do this in a calculator. There's 10 carat 9 for 10 to the power of 9, obviously. Or do 1 times 10 to the 9. So 1 E9. So 1 times 10 to the 9 would be 1, then the E button 9. That's actually what I do, because I can never find the caret button on my calculator. It's always in a different spot, but the E button's always in the same spot. So I usually do the 1 E9. So if you've got 2.5 million, it's probably just making that mistake of doing 10 times 10 to the 9 instead of 1 E9. So just a, a reminder on getting used to your calculators, remembering where the, the functions are that we use. Okay, so of course the E is 10 to the power after it. Okay. For, uh, for like your homework in, in lab and stuff like that, yeah, but for exams we will specifically require, it's mentioned in the syllabus, um, uh, we do have to use those TI-30s. So um, yeah, we do have to get a TI-30 for all you guys, either the battery powered one uh, or the, the sort of solar one. The solar one is actually a little better, like the TI-30 X2S, um, it's this calculator here. So this is the one I would look for. There's, uh, there's a slightly different version of the TI-30 you could use, it's not as friendly. This one has the second answer button, so that's the other TI-30 we allow doesn't have that second answer button. Okay. Get this at Target, it's cheaper at Target than the bookstore, it's like 20, 25 bucks at the bookstore, it's like 10 or 15 bucks at Target. Yeah. So moving forward, yes. That's good. Okay. So another topic in chapter one, just two terms I want to make sure that we're on the same page with. Um, sometimes they're used interchangeably in, in common lingo. Sometimes you see Maybe more popular press use these terms as if they're the same, but they actually have a different meaning. Precision and accuracy have two different uh, definitions, if you will. Precision is about how repeatable a particular measurement is. It could be wrong every single time. You know? So like if you're um, aiming at the bullseye and all three of your, your darts go way off the target where you're shooting for, then you would say, wow, you somehow have really good precision, but you're just really inaccurate of not hitting that target. So accuracy is hitting the target. It's how close you're coming to the true value or the intended target. So if you're accurate, you're hitting the target. Um, if you're precise, you're hitting the same location. If you're precise and accurate, you're hitting the target every single time. Now where this falls into uh, place in a, in, a, in a chapter like this one here has a little bit to do with like lab measurements. So when you go on to, to use a particular tool in the lab, you're kind of assuming that it's generally accurate, that it's like calibrated to be accurate of what it's measuring, and then it's also generally precise. So if you keep taking the same measurement, then generally you'll get the same result, maybe with some small variation. And that small variation kind of has to do with the sig fig problem that we're talking about. So like, if you imagine taking an object on and off the balance, like re-zeroing it, doing it again, you're gonna find that your, say, one point, two, three, four, five object, um, that some of the times you'll see Oh, it's a six, sometimes it's a five, sometimes it's a four. But it's gonna be pretty close to some average value. So you can have some confidence that that value is closer to one number as opposed to some other number. Um, and then you can also have confidence after you see that an instrument works, maybe you test it out, that you can just use it once and just get the value off of it and then report it with uh, an uncertainty of 0 .0001 grams. So like your uncertainty is following in that last uncertain placeholder. Um, or just understand that this value here would only have five significant digits. It wouldn't have more than five sig figs um, for this particular type of measurement. So it just kind of ties into how we're thinking and using sig figs um, in this chapter, that the lab measurements we're taking, they're not 100% accurate, 100% precise, so there is this inherent impreciseness that's leading uh, to us counting sig figs. 
Okay, there's um, a small discussion. Get your cup. <laughs> so there's a discussion in the book about some different types of glassware. This one's a little bit more to lab, but I wanted to make sure we discussed the difference between the types of glassware you might use for different sorts of situations. So, you know, in the lab, you might have access to things like graduated cylinders, syringes, burettes, pipettes, and volumetric flasks. They each have their own sort of intended purpose. Um, glassware is usually um, classified as either being a delivery uh, device or a containing device. So, some glassware is calibrated to contain the indicated volume. Other glassware is calibrated to deliver the indicated volume. And graduated cylinders are actually sometimes marked either or. So if you look at a graduated cylinder, um, a lot of times it'll either be marked TC or TD. Relatively important to note the difference. If it's TD, it's calibrated to deliver 10 mils. So you can imagine if you fill it up to the 10 milliliter mark, it's probably a little bit higher than 10 milliliters because it's calibrated to know that it's gonna leave a couple drops behind when you actually pour it out. Um, so it's gonna be more calibrated to deliver 10 mils than it is to contain 10 mils. Um, if you see a graduated cylinder marked TD, it's going to be calibrated to, um, or excuse me, if you see it marked TD, it's calibrated to deliver the volume, TC to contain that volume. A volumetric flask is almost exclusively a containing device. So a volumetric flask, you'll find these in like the 25 mil varieties or the 100 mil varieties, usually like in some whole number of uh, milliliters, and they're calibrated that if you fill it, there's a little marking line, if you fill it to that line, that it's say 25.0 milliliters. So you get about three sig figs when you use a volumetric flask. If you buy like a narrower neck volumetric flask, maybe you can get that to two sig figs. So maybe you have a smaller volumetric flask with like a thinner neck, maybe you can get um, two digits of precision. So depending on the glassware you're using, there's usually an indicated tolerance. It might be in this case 0.1 milliliters. It might be um, 0.01 milliliters, de depending on the device that you're using. Uh, pipettes are what we use a lot in the labs. They have a little bulb. You have like a 5, a 10, or a 25. Um, they make all different size pipettes. The ones we use most often, I think, are 5 and 10 in the general chemistry labs. And again, these have a mark on them. You fill it very carefully. It's kind of tedious to do. Uh, but you fill it to that mark, and then you know at that moment that that pipette's actually calibrated to deliver then that quantity of liquid. And this is usually pretty precise. So this is usually to two decimal places. So if you use it correctly, so if you fill it with the meniscus to the fill line, um, if it's a five mil pipette, then you're gonna get three sig figs. If you use a 10 mil pipette, usually you're getting still two decimal places of significance. You're getting like four significant figures on the volume. Now if you need to deliver a precise but a very specific quantity, like a pipette's good if you need to, to deliver 10 mils repeatedly, um, but then you might use a burette if sometimes you need to deliver 8.74 milliliters and maybe some other time you need to deliver 12.76. So a burette is used when you need to deliver a specific quantity. Um, they're really useful in titration problems we'll look at in chapter four where you're gonna have like say an acid solution, you're gonna be adding a base, and you're gonna try to precisely figure out how much of the one solution you need to neutralize the other with. And that'll be really useful for that type of problem. Syringes, we don't use these a whole lot in the chemistry lab, but these are um, useful devices for delivering um, di uh, liquids, kind of like a burette. Um, but so if you know you need to deliver 5.5 milliliters, pretty easy to use a syringe. And also graduated cylinders are also useful. So I just wanted to kind of make sure we're on the same page. Of, there's different glassware for different purposes. They're used in slightly different ways. Some glassware is used to contain or deliver liquids. Um, and then each of the devices we use has some inherent like tolerance. You can either understand or be told the tolerance. I think that's what we do in lab. You can also read that tolerance off the device. So if you uh, work in a research lab, you get handed a pipette, usually you can actually read on the pipette what its tolerance is. It'll usually say plus or minus like 0 0.02 milliliters or whatever it happens to be for that particular class of glassware. And oddly enough, there are different classes of glassware. There's like class A, B, and C glassware. The, obviously, the higher the class, the more expensive. You know, so there are different tolerances for different types of glassware that you might find around the lab. Now let's come back to another sig fig discussion because I think it's important for us to always remember like what it means. Sig figs are related to these inexact measured quantities. So if we count 12 eggs, how many sig figs does that quantity have? You might say two, but it's not really two. We're, if we count 12 eggs, we're not going to argue if there's 11 or 13. You know, so if we can see with our eyes that we have a dozen eggs, this is an exact quantity. So we don't count the sig figs on exact quantities. So we would not call this two sig figs. So if you look at this and say two sig figs, I'd say that that's wrong. Definitely not two sig figs. You could say infinite. I would just say it's an exact quantity. It's probably a better way to word it. 
Um, so if we see 1.050 liters of water, how many sig figs in that quantity? We have four. So that, now, you could say, well, how do you know that that wasn't some exact quantity? Well, there really is no exact quantity of volume. You know, like there's always going to be some inherent impreciseness whenever we're measuring volume of a substance. So there's always going to be, uh, we're always going to look at the digits, count them up um, for the sig figs and something like that. Mass measurement, how many sig figs here? That's three. That's easy. Now, what about the burette? Like, if you saw that in the lab, what, what would you call that measurement? We can zoom in here. So, so some of you might say 20. If you, if you just wrote down 20 mils in your notebook, what's kind of wrong with that? Aren't you probably more precise that it's 20 than, say, 19 or, or uh, like, we're fairly certain this isn't 21, right? Like, there's not some oscillation problem here. We can, pro we can definitely see it's at 20.0. But can we also tell that it's nowhere near 20.1 or 20 or, or 19.9? Like it's nowhere near here or here. So we could probably actually say that this is 20.00. So usually whenever you look at your scale, you can look at your scale and say, okay, it's going every tenth of a milliliter. So the scale is 0 0.1, excuse me, 0 0.1 milliliters is the scale reading. You can interpolate between the scale. So you could tell the difference between 20.0, if it were 20.5, it would come down in the middle, and you could tell that difference. So with a burette, you're usually getting, and with almost any device that you imagine having these scale readings, you're, you can interpolate between the scale. You might have to uh, squint, you might have to get like a card reader if you're reading a burette, get really close and see it. Um, I have to zoom in, my eyes aren't very good anymore. Um, I don't know, probably getting old, I guess. But my wife keeps telling me I need to get glasses, I'm like, no, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> but I think I need reading glasses or something. But so if, if, if you're having a hard time seeing it, you know, maybe you just you know, need to put on a pair of reading glasses um, or just need to get closer or find something usually uh, to put behind a burette. So the key is whenever you have a scale reading and value in between it, of course you can interpolate um, and get one extra digit of precision when you're reading off those volumes. So you use burettes a fair bit in lab. So I know that TAs are always talking about students who write down the volume to only like the 0.1 milliliter mark when you can really write it down to the point zero zero to the hundredth place in the, the milliliter mark there. Okay, so uh, dimensional analysis we mentioned is the last section. We use this to convert units. Obviously, that's the main intention of dimensional analysis, but we also, like I said, use it to solve a wide variety of problems. We'll point those problems out when we're using scientific notation. Okay, so this problem here, before we get started, what I want to try to do is um, give you a couple conversion factors I want you to consider using in this problem. A problem like this, sometimes people just run to Google. Like you can just go like 225 liters equals question mark like cubic meters and it'll just tell you. And like you can do that, but that's really helpful on a test. So what I want us to do is try to think of the conversion factors that you might have available on a test to make this kind of conversion. So let's say the only conversion factors that you have are, um, well, let's say you don't have any. And that the only one that you might remember, the only one you might remember is 100 centimeters is a meter. So let's say that's the only conversion factor that you know. Can you use that conversion factor? Maybe you also remember this one. We usually wouldn't give you these ones, so you have to like remember these. So remember these conversions and try to use them to solve this particular problem.
I opened a problem up, but that's because I, I was like, what does that button do? I take about one more minute on this one. I did open the previous two questions back up, so we might, if you weren't able to get a response in for the first two, you can try those now. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem here. Okay, now I did give the direct conversion that you may have remembered and had a hard time forgetting and just using here, and that's fine. Like if you just remember a cubic meter is point, I almost made it, so a cubic meter is a thousand liters, then maybe you could have used that conversion here. And then maybe you could say, well, can you show a solution a second way? So can you solve a problem a second way using these conversion factors here? It's relatively easy, so what I might do is the same way we did before. So the number of cubic meters is what we're looking for. We're gonna start with what we're provided, 225 liters. Um, if I'm gonna use this conversion, I need to go over to milliliters. So I do one liter, 1,000 milliliters. A milliliter is a cubic centimeter. Now, of course, you might say, well, if a milliliter is a cubic centimeter, I could have just done that here, and then skipped showing a step. So that would be fine if we want to skip showing a one-to-one -one step. We could do that as well. And then um, 100 centimeters is a meter, but does that mean that 100 cubic centimeters is a cubic meter? No. So if we're thinking of a one meter by one meter box, it'd be much bigger than that. So imagine you have one meter by one meter by one meter in terms of a box. That would be 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters. You have one cubic meter. That would be equal to 100 centimeters cubed, which of course would be 100 cubed centimeters cubed. So in other words, what we need to do is take our sort of one-to-one -one conversion that we know, like 100 centimeters is a meter, and then we can know all I need to do is cube the conversion factor. We're one cubic meter is 100 cubed centimeters cubed. And then with that one simple conversion factor I remember, I can then apply that to this volume problem. Okay, so then I can use the cubic unit here, cubic centimeters cancels, liter cancels, I get cubic meters. And so then I do get the same re responses maybe I would have if I just remembered 1,000 liters is a cubic meter, but maybe that's not provided on a test. So maybe we don't have that direct conversion given to us and we have to kind of figure it out on the fly. This is how we might figure it out on the fly. Making these cubic conversions, there's always like a question on a test usually that gets at making some sort of cubic conversion to make sure that you know how to take the conversion factor you might know of in the normal sense and then imagine cubing the conversion factor. So you can imagine like a cubic inch to cubic centimeters. One inch is 2.54 centimeters, so one cubic inch would be 2.54 cubed centimeters cubed. So you can do this with any unit you can imagine. Usually there's some sort of problem, and there's a couple of problems in the practice quizzes to give you a sense of those type of conversion problems. They're really just glorified um, dimensional analysis problems that get at making some density conversions and using um, our conversion factors. I might open up the next problem, but the next problem is just getting at a temperature calculation problem. Of course, we have the Kelvin scales, our SI unit of temperature. That's our degree C temperature plus 273.15. Um, in the US, of course, we usually think Fahrenheit, and I think Fahrenheit is actually better for weather. I think I will uh, um, prove me wrong if you think Celsius is the better scale for temperature um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I don't know like how the high of like 26 versus 27 degrees, it seems like way too small of a difference, whereas like 90 versus 95, that makes more sense. So I don't know, I like Fahrenheit for weather forecasts. But the Fahrenheit to Celsius scales are shown. These equations generally provided when you need them on tests and quizzes. Uh, the thing I really wanted to, to highlight is the, um, how the Kelvin and the Celsius scale uh, have a similar property. 
And then if you imagine going from, say, the freezing point of water, zero degrees C, to the boiling point of water, that's 100 degrees C spread of temperature. And then if you add 273 Kelvin onto each of those measurements, so 273 Kelvin would be the freezing point of water in Kelvin, 373 Kelvin would be the boiling point of water. Notice how that's also a 100 Kelvin difference. So we have a 100 degree C increase to the boiling point of water, a 100 Kelvin increase to the boiling point of water. So like the difference of temperature in Celsius and Kelvin are the same. Uh, the units themselves aren't the same, but the difference in temperature would be the same. So if you're in Celsius, you go up by a degree, that's the 25 to 26 degrees, say, is the same as if you're at 298 Kelvin, you go up a degree to 299 Kelvin. So one degree um, increment in temperature is the same in both scales. And of course, that's not true in Fahrenheit. So it's worth pointing out that, of course, 32 to 212 uh, Fahrenheit um, don't sort of correspond to a 100 degree difference in temperature. So the Fahrenheit scale on its own, kind of in terms of where it fits in to a difference of temperature, um, when you look at the Celsius and the Kelvin scales. There is a fourth scale, I never remember what it's called, that is actually the absolute temperature in relation to Fahrenheit. Does anybody know the name of that one? I don't know. But there is like an absolute temperature scale for Fahrenheit, so it's some number that you would just add to the Fahrenheit temperature, just like the Kelvin scale has some other name. It's rarely used. Um, but there is kind of an absolute temperature scale based on Fahrenheit that is uh, its own unit. But anyways, um, just working with the temperatures and getting familiar with their scales is kind of relevant. So some of you have already looked at this problem, but if you haven't, which measurement below represents lowest temperature? So take about one more minute on this problem. I've opened the next question for those who are kind of ahead of schedule, but if you want to start looking at the next one, feel free. So the temperature question, pretty easy. The highest temperature, which one would be the highest? This Celsius would be the highest temperature. So 25 degrees is about room temperature, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. 25 degrees F is below freezing, so it's probably minus three or four degrees C. So that'd be in the middle. 25 Kelvin is almost at the lowest temperature you can get to, which is zero Kelvin. That's worth noting that the Kelvin scale is intended for zero Kelvin to be the lowest temperature um, any substance could attain, the lowest possible temperature, and then everything's higher than that. So we're getting pretty close to zero Kelvin. So this would be minus um, to whatever it would be, 240 something uh, degrees C. So really low in terms of this temperature. So obviously the Kelvin would represent the lowest temperature. Okay, and so then uh, what we have here is this kind of a random dimensional analysis problem. So we have a company that needs a particular chemical that costs a certain amount. Given a density, how much does it cost to buy the uh, required quantity? So you guys can give that one a try. I'll give, give you guys the money for this afterwards.
Okay, so let's take a look at this one. I think, oh, actually, let's give another minute. So we'll give you one, one more minute. Okay, so we'll take a look here. So we're gonna calculate how much money it takes to buy this chemical. It's, this is actually a really weird problem for sig figs, but we'll talk about the sig figs in a moment. But so, again, sometimes in a sig fig problem, we don't know where to start. Somehow we just need to start with something that we're given. And worst case scenario, we get money in the denominator, and then we just need to flip everything and go do it again. So if you're never not sure, this problem is pretty straightforward that you can probably have a good idea of which one we wanna start with. But let's start with the volume here. And like I said, if you do find that you get the money in the denominator, all we need to do is figure out how to flip everything and try the problem again. Our density is grams per milliliter, so I need to go liters over to milliliters. So a lot of milliliters here. And then um, what we need to do there is um, use the density, figure out how many grams we need. So 1.15 grams per milliliter. So milliliters have canceled, liters have canceled. We have the cost per kilogram. And so what we might do is do 1,000 grams per kilogram. And then it falls right out from there, $12.53 per kilogram. Which is oddly a cheap chemical, relatively cheap. 12 bucks for a kilogram or something. It certainly isn't cocaine. <laughs> Not Prove me wrong. <laughs> okay. Now. So we could be savvy and cancel the thousand and do the arithmetic. Okay, let's, like, so simply thinking sig figs here, we're counting like two sig figs, right? So we see two sig figs, so we round to two significant figures. And we would give, you know, the answer, the answer works out to be about $360,000. Um, sounds like the amount you might spend on cocaine, but not for this quantity. <laughs> um, so anyways, the, the weird sig fig part about this problem is actually the sig figs are totally broke. It, it, but I don't want us to think too heavy about these things, you know? So like when you start thinking sig figs, um, you know, like when you get to the point where you're paying per kilogram, you would probably calculate specifically how many kilograms you need, and then you gotta pay however much that is, right? You know, so like, you know, like if you find that you need a um, hundred and uh, if, you, if you find you need 1,200 of something and it costs like $1.55 each, and you're paying $1.55 times however many you buy. You know, so once money comes in, that's a counted unit. So, but, but at the same time, we're not gonna, you know, we're just really looking at the sig figs here and rounding the usual way of looking at the measured quantity with its sig figs and then capping that off at the end. 
the more, like, you might think, okay, once you get the number of kilograms, you're specifically paying for however many kilograms you actually do order. So, um, so sick bigs here kind of does break down in a way, but not in a way that um, I would worry too much about it. So we're looking two sick bigs times two. I'm going to throw one more quick question at us, because this kind of, like, if we miss this question, I think we've, we need to do a quick gloss over. It's not in the notes, but um, it should pop up on top hat. So when you're converting 14.75 inches to centimeters using the ordinary conversion factor in inches, 2.54 centimeters, how many digits should be reported? Okay, so the answer is all four. So all four digits are still significant because again, 2.54 centimeters is exactly an inch. That's not limiting the preciseness of our conversion once we make that conversion. The exact number in terms of 2.54. Guys, let me make one last note here about the top hat problems. Um, I'm leaving them open during class for chapter one just because we're all getting acclimated with using top hat. Once we get to chapter two, the problems will stop as soon as, you know, I'll put a, a 60 second timer and once that problem ends, you won't be able to go back and enter or change your answer. So if you've been kind of like, okay, I can change my answer after the fact, that's just something we've been doing for chapter one. Once we get into chapter two, once I start discussing a problem, you won't be able to go back and change your answer. So just know that's coming on Friday. We'll make mention of this on Friday as well, but not a big detail in terms of points. Um, all right, guys, have a great day. I'll see you on Friday.